course review. There you go. You're my student back in the day, weren't you, boy? I remember that. Let's see. Let's have a look. This video was asked for like a couple of times. And Nobody asked for the video. <laughs> <laughs> if you're being honest, you just wanted the affiliate commission back That's then, bro. Yeah. And I wasn't sure I could give like an unbiased. Is the affiliate link still in there, or that would be removed now? Nah, so I removed that, yeah. Go on, bro. Remember this. This is throwback. So, you know, you've got your clients, and now it's time to get like, into the. We thought about this yesterday, though, Amy. Like, that was the course was so practical. Like, so. It just told you exactly what you need to do. No bullshit, no, yeah. no fancy, just, okay, do this, say this, say that. Yeah. When I remember the closing script was something like, um, you'd say the price and you'd say something like, uh, the closing script back then was like, so this is going to cost me about 10 hours a week. My hourly rate is 20, therefore yeah. it's 200 a week. Um, you know, therefore it's, you know, X amount a month. Does that sound fair enough? Or something like that, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And it worked though, right? That's what's yeah. crazy. It, it, the thing is back then, things things have changed so much now. And I feel like if you released uh, a program like that now, I don't know how well it would do because I feel like some a lot of people uh, attach more so to the bells and whistles to it rather than the practicality. And maybe I'm wrong on that, but it- Yeah, no, I agree. So much. Yeah, I think, I think back then, like the practicality was more valued. And then obviously when more and more people started bringing out courses, you sort of needed something new to, to sort of separate yourself from the rest. I remember when I first brought out my course, I was asking you, like, should I record it in Bali or something like that? And you were like, no, you don't need, you can record the ads in Bali, but the course itself can just be in your bedroom. Like no one cares. Yeah. Just, the uh, thing is back then as well, we just had this conversation yesterday. I mean, that was back in, in 2018 and it makes me realize how long I've actually been around this game, you know? Like yeah. I, I, you think back then it was the UK entrepreneurship scene. It was like, we, we were just saying like a lot of the people that you see these days who are most popular and, and around the space, a lot of which are like, coached by me back in the day which is so crazy to see because it was only three years ago but the yeah. industry changed so much and it means to me i was back there like back in the beginning but i mean three years isn't that long in terms of business but i feel like in the smma industry yeah a lot has changed in three years yeah 100 percent. yeah because that's funny you should say that because like i so i first got in actually you know what you reached out to me on instagram i remember that yeah, yeah. i was it was like it was around christmas time and i was bowling with the family and then you reached out to me and I, I was like, I, I watched this guy on YouTube. Yeah. And then um, you only had like a two or three videos or something like that. But because it was like SMA related, I watched it. And then uh, you said, should we do a collab? And that's how we sort of got in touch. But I remember, I remember thinking like, oh yeah, like that's, that's cool. Like someone else is doing SMA as well. But back then it wasn't, if, if, if you were doing SMA and someone else was doing SMA, you'd immediately have like a connection. Mm -hmm. whereas now there's so many people doing it it's it's no longer you were doing thing. fitness stuff back then because you were making a yeah. transition so we were in two very different spaces really because i'd at that point been running my agency for about six months mainly using i was mainly like i had just really transitioned from freelancer to automating and outsourcing everything and yeah. my, my angle back then was like it's very different to now you know like now I've got physical employees, offices and stuff and management. But back then it was, I had just transitioned from being a freelancer and learned how to outsource. And I was like making pretty decent money with very high profit margins, basically not doing much. Um, and, and, uh, but I still very new to the game, really. I could have been having my business maybe six, nine, 12 months, whatever. Um, yeah. And then you, you had actually been transitioning. So you'd been doing fitness coaching and making money from that but yeah. you just transitioned into running an agency. And did you, uh, did you have clients when we first started talking or not? I had, so when we first started talking, I had, I think I was on the verge of getting one client. Yeah. And yeah. then when, when you released your course, so yeah, so I went from, I went from fitness content and then there was a guy called Isaac Marley. I'm not sure you're familiar with him. I remember him. Yeah. He was OG back in the day, wasn't he? Yeah. He, so he was doing the same. He was doing fitness yeah. content. And we both had like three, 400 subscribers on YouTube. So because we were doing the same thing, just he was in Australia, I was in, in the Netherlands, we sort of like kept in touch and we used to comment on each other's videos and stuff like that. And um, he started doing like promo videos and content creation. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. That's not like fitness related, but he was making money off of it. And I just remember like, it looked cool. It looked like, you know, it looked like the, the real deal. And it was back then when Christian Guzman had, um, 
the first time he got a videographer on board, and it was um, the guy with the with the with the rasters. I forget his name now. He was only there for a short period. Yeah. But like you know, so so all of a sudden, Christian Guzman's got this videographer. Uh, Isaac's doing this content creation stuff. So I thought, okay, there's something here with this content creation. I need to get onto that as well. And then I started off from promo videos and slowly making that tra- transition on YouTube. And I remember thinking as well, like, how is my audience going to react? I, bear in mind, 300 subscribers. No one yeah, cared. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no one oh my God, how am I going to do this? Do I need to change my Instagram handle from Joshua yeah. Daniel Fitness? You know, yeah, how am yeah. I going to do all this? How am I going to pull it off without uh, looking like a sellout or something like that? Um, yeah, so then I done content creation and that was sort of like the main thing I was doing content creation and I wanted to do local social media management because um, just because like that's sort of how the market was like transitioned to everyone that was doing content creation starts offering social media content as well and um, that's when we sort of got in touch and I remember my dad put me in touch with a recruitment agency in, in London that he was working alongside and said they need they wanted exposure. That's what he said. They want exposure on social media. So if you help yeah. them out. And then um, that company actually said, well, you know, we'll fly you and your dad out to London, you know, so we can meet up and we can discuss what's possible. And that's when um, I remember I was at the airport at the gate and you put on Instagram saying, I'm going to release this course. You said something like, I've landed 20 clients in the last like 30 days. I'm going to release this course. Um, you know, the, the beta price is X amount of no or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. I remember replying to that thing, bloody hell, 20 clients. Like, yeah. imagine having that all like on social media management because Facebook ads were still in its infancy. Well, no, it was, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, th- it's three years ago is a long time, a short time, but it feels like such a long time in this industry because yeah. back then, Facebook ads, it was, it was still, the, I would still say it was the main th- the concept of SMMA and stuff like that, but like management was kind of my angle back then i would say like initially yeah. when i first launched the program there wasn't i don't think i don't think in that first program i did have any facebook ads content i think it was all social management wasn't it oh yeah it was it was all social management but that was like the thing back then because it yeah. felt like an easy like facebook ads like obviously nowadays there's so much content on youtube available for facebook ads yeah but back then it was like it was this like it was like an enigma like no one really understood it and you had like the Ty Lopez courses that were explaining like what the pixel was, but even that. So basic, like, right? Yeah, but it felt like such like advanced, you know, like technology. Like I just couldn't get my head around it. And social media management just felt like tangible, easy. I understood it. And then back then I felt like the whole community was much tighter back then as well because it was smaller. So everyone knew everyone in the industry and everyone like connected, like genuinely like was trying to help out. And everyone was sort of like saying like, um like the younger generation which is what, what we were back then we understand social media whereas the older generations don't therefore we're native to the platform we we understand instagram the algorithm and stuff like that and the older generation cut it these days would it really <laughs> no 100 no it's like yeah but back then that was that was a big thing and social media management was like was was was, was a very popular way of getting started with, uh, with yeah, SMA. you had you had success because i remember because you know, I don't know if a lot of people watching this, I mean, it depends. Some of the, some of the newer people will not know much about the fact that how long we've known each other and stuff like that. But, you know, yeah. me and Josh go back like, right to the very beginning, really, of our online entrepreneurship journey. Yeah. And you actually think about it like, you know, you had you had pretty early success with the program when it was launched. Like most people did, honestly, like yeah. not to my own horn at all here, but literally almost everyone who joined no, the program 100%, yeah, had definitely. success with it, right? Especially back then when it was new, fresh, so practical. And, uh, you know, I was never claiming it to be something to get you to seven figures or even, you know, to grow multiple six figures. But people, if you want to get your first client, it worked. And I remember you messaged me after like a week in the program. You're like, yeah, like I've set all these meetings and closed deals. And I think I've even got testimonials still back on like the, the web page back in like some old stuff. And it was crazy. But I, as soon as we connected, like we just got on like right away. Yeah, and I, was, I called good. you yeah. up. I, I phoned you up. I, I don't know what it was over. I don't know. This was before we become business partners because I think a lot of people won't know that either. But we were, we actually, yeah, we had a. Uh, so that when, when I went on that trip in London, we, we had a WhatsApp call. And um, I think you were living in. Was it with Bali's parents or something like yeah, that? Yeah, I was living with my well now fiance at the time. She was my girlfriend, but I was living at her parents' house because I 
I moved, so I, I went to uni, and as a lot of people know, I dropped out of uni. But when I dropped out of uni, I, I met my now fiance at university. So I moved up to live with where she lives in the country. So when we first went up there, and I only had my company for a year, so I couldn't get a mortgage. So we actually ended up moving in to, to her parents' house. So I think I remember being in their kitchen, and I don't know why we called. I think it was the first time outside of Instagram DMs that we'd ever connected, wasn't it? Yeah, we had like a WhatsApp call. Yeah. And when was... would that have been? 2018, probably? Yeah, so it, it was on. So the very first time it was on that London trip, it was like January two thousand eighteen, something like that. Yeah. Um, I always get mixed up with two thousand seventeen, two thousand eighteen. It's sort of all like more into one. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was around that time anyway, and I remember you saying like, "Okay, I've got twenty cl- a list." Like, because I wanted to know like, how did you get twenty clients? And you were yeah. saying it's all through freelancer websites like Upwork. Yeah, yeah. And you said like, "That's what the course is about." So I was like, oh, I can't wait for this course. Like, this course is going to be an absolute game changer. And you were sort of giving me, like, the basics of Upwork. And I remember I was being, I was in the hotel room with my dad. Um, he was just getting his emails sorted on his iPad. And I remember, like, logging in onto Upwork for the first time and, like, creating a profile and stuff like that. Um, and just, like, browsing, like, just seeing, like, what was available. And back then, like, no one was really on. I feel like you were the very, very, very first person ever on, like, in the SMA space to sort of do it via that method. Yeah, I, I bought that whole thing to market, which is crazy. 100%, um, yeah. No one knew about it. And that's why it went really well, because we, me and Josh, like, just before we started putting the camera on here to, to film, we looked back for our old channels and we found a couple of videos where back then, one of the biggest angles and selling points to um, the Upwork freelance method was no cold calling. Like we, yeah. we had a video, you might even be able to get it up and find it, but the video was called How Josh landed a client or two clients or whatever without cold calling or going door to door now for most people if you're new to this space like you wouldn't even think nobody talks about cold calling or going door to door much these days but back then that was kind of like the go-to i believe he never made a cold call he never made a cold call yeah without cold call or door to door yeah crazy right and that that was the difference so like the 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 big benefit for, for that back then was that you didn't have to cold call. You didn't have to go door to door. Fantastic for introverts. No matter where you are around the world, yeah. you can do it from your laptop. Um, and it was very applicable, right? Like you said, like it was very practical, the program. Um, um, and it's crazy. But then, I mean, just to fast forward then, I don't know how long it was. I mean, how it was probably, what, six months, maybe even 12 months until we became business partners, right? We actually, we don't work together anymore. And we're going to discuss reasons why. Yeah. We've actually gone in very two very different directions now, which is awesome. Yeah. And and that and we're still very good friends but it, it, it's i'd be well I would, i'd like to get into that a bit more but i'd like to, let's put a date on it like do you remember when we when we decided let's partner up in our agencies and and you know basically i, yeah, I think it, it was around may t- around may time that's what i know so i think it was may 2018 was it I in may was, was it not 19 do you reckon it was 18 yeah because 18 was 19 2019 was was the year um 2000 yeah 2018 was the year that i first went to rome and toronto and that was in august and that was obviously that i kind of went up to meet quentin and jovan and by that time we were already business partners so yeah. i had to be in may of 2018 18, yeah. so that means you released that course in january 2018 um and the first client that got through upway was called eminds club um yeah. And basically, it was this guy who wanted to recreate like LinkedIn for entrepreneurs. The concept sounds quite cool, but he, yeah. he basically what he wanted, he wanted a bunch of Twitter followers, Instagram followers, and stuff like that. So I thought, okay, social media management. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember asking you, like, should I outsource this or should I do it myself? Yeah. And you were like, no, 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 no. You need, you know, you, you know, this is the first client. Just outsource it the same way you found this job in the first place through Upwork as well. Um, and I've done that. And the guy was just, he was constantly complaining. He wanted weekly phone calls. Bear in mind, this guy's in America. So I had to call him up every week physically, like on the, on the phone. Yeah. Um, and I had to explain, or I had to tell him like face to face or, you know, on the phone call, obviously, how many Twitter followers he had gained and how many Instagram followers he had gained through my posting. And it was just, it was an absolute nightmare. Um, and I remember asking, I asked both you and Quentin, like, what should I do? Should I drop him or should I keep it going? And you, you guys both said, just keep it going for as long as you can, because at the end of the day, it's an hour a day out here, you know, out, out, you know, an hour out of your day to, to set it yeah. all up. You know, you can you can outsource the post and just deal with as as bullshit for you know for however long it lasts. 
And then three months in, because I charge them, I charge them like 600 a month for 30 posts. Yeah. When, when you think about it, like it's, it's mad the way we got away with that. Uh, because there's no direct ROI on management. I think it's the thing is it's it's interesting, right? And I think back then, you know, you look back now on how far we've come, and you know the concept sounds great on paper, but realistically, it 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 misses. The, the, there's so many holes that need to be plugged like all the important shit that i look at now when i'm running a company like my customer lifetime value retention client happiness all of that stuff back then was kind of disregarded for how little can i do and how much money can i make which yeah, you know exactly. what if you're just trying to run a little freelance business that's fine when you're trying to build an empire like i'm trying to build over the, my lifetime that yeah. isn't going to cut it right you have to that focus on your product and the quality back then you know we were so new to all of this really that i think whilst it was great there was still and you know like that the method now is to, you know i still use up what to this day and we still get a lot of clients from there um we do it a, a lot differently to, to back then but it was interesting though isn't it because you look at the concept like you know you charge what 600 bucks a month for posts you say that could be quite a lot for con for in context of the fact that we're outsourcing that for back then probably like 50 bucks a month like that's mental not even know? that i think it was i think i, I think i also that for like 35 dollars that's for 95 percent yeah. margins which is yeah, absolutely crazy yeah. whereas you know whereas if you actually look at it now like um 600 bucks a month like i've got management clients um i've got one right now that pays me over a thousand bucks a month about 1100 bucks a month and we basically manage a facebook group for them i haven't spoken to them like because you know we had a lot of back and forth when we first started the relationship yeah but they're a huge company so it depends how you look at it because they are I can't say their name, but they are in, in the product that they sell. They are, they are the number one in the industry. So they're the biggest in that product. So a thousand dollars a month to them and the return that they get from the management of the Facebook group, they sell yeah. a product that's about two, 300 bucks um, and there's upsells and stuff. So there's like add-ons and that to the product, you know, yeah. so an average customer to them is worth three, 400 bucks. So if we can, from a Facebook group, generate a couple of customers a month, they're pretty happy and they're such a big business. It makes sense. But yeah. It's a bit different, I think, when it's like a beginner, bit beginner startup who wants. They think yeah. that back in the day, I, I, the amount of management clients I would speak to that would want to get sales and 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 revenue and return from just posting a few posts, it was was crazy. But as we know now, that probably isn't the best way to. Well, that's it. Like that's, I think that's sort of where um, with like with the management, that's sort of where we went wrong. But that's sort of how it was back in the day. Like yeah. you would you would promote managing the socials as you're going to get sales from this and followers and stuff like that when indirectly you might but because it's difficult to show them the roi you know that sort of way that's i think that's why we both sort of transitioned to facebook ads and started offering that as well just because yeah. it's easier to to show them okay this is how much money we've made yet this is yeah. how much money we've spent but um yeah after after like Three months. This guy. Uh, sorry, bro, I'm gonna have to. Sorry, two sec. I've got. No to I've got. I've got to take this. Sorry, mate. We can just. Yeah, no, no worries, man. No worries. I'll. Uh, I'll continue with the story anyway. But after after two and a half months, um, the guy, he basically stopped the job because we we did everything through Upwork, and uh, he he stopped the job post and he basically messaged me saying, "Listen, you know, we're gonna stop working together after you know this this uh, this period has ended," and he was the one who left like a negative comment like a negative um you know a negative review on my upwork channel and um it made me also maybe realize how dependent you are if you use upwork as the platform and um, to get your clients and you keep the clients on upwork how dependent you actually are on um you know on 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 what they say because one bad review can put your whole profile back i was just saying then like how with upwork if you get a bad review like how much impact that can actually have on the rest yeah. of your profile. It's, it's massive, isn't it? I mean, it goes both ways though, because if you have a built up profile, loads of good reviews, it does the opposite. Like yeah. at this point now, my profile, you know, I've nurtured it over the years. I've got a decent amount of earnings on the profile, um, top rated plus, which puts me in the top 2% of all freelancers on the platform. Um, I've got hundred percent job success score. I've got all five star reviews. Besides I've got one that's like a four star review. All the others are five stars. Um, and that means then if I'm, if I'm reaching out to hundred people and someone else is reaching out to hundred people, I'm going to probably oh, get yeah. better responses, but, but then it's, it, you, it's a risk you take, but that's why you have to consider the opposite end as well. Because if you get a shit review from someone, you do a terrible service, then you can't just blag it because else you're going to get a one-star review, which is going to have the adverse effect, which is you're going to yeah. get no responses. Right. So it is a constantly like treading on eggshells, but 
it makes you realize it's a lesson that I learned. It's like very early on in business and I've come so far and I know this a lot more, more now, but you have to take on clients really that you can, you know, you can help. You yeah. have to, your red flag detector comes up massively because you know, if you take on someone and you tell on that first call nightmare, super high maintenance going to cause a lot of issues. It makes you start to think, okay, I've got to think beyond just the short term money here. I've got to think yeah. how much money long term am I going to lose? If I get a one star review from this person, what is that going to do indirectly for all future prospects? I get, it might put off deals like 2k a month deals, 3k a month deals. It might put them off from ever responding to you. So yeah. it, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, Back in the day, I think we definitely blagged it a lot more now. Like now it's a proper company. I know what I'm doing. You know, I've been around the block. I've had my company five years and stuff, but it's um, it's something that, I mean, it's interesting to see our growth. I feel like when we look back across the last um, five years, you know what I mean? I feel like we've both come come a long way. And I suppose it could take us really on to the next part to, to discuss really is how we've both gone in very different directions. I mean, I suppose we could speak about the fact yeah. we parted ways and why we parted ways but ultimately you know we won't go into it too much but me and josh used to work together in the agency yeah. and we parted ways completely amicably and it was absolutely fine but we basically just wanted different things out of the agency and we look yeah. back now and it's difficult for the both of us you know we wanted to make it work but you know we realized in the end i think we were both very much the same person in the business and it and, yeah and we it, said that yes you didn't and it was a lot of fun, right? Like, you know, it was, it was class, like speaking every day, running a business with somebody, having a second pair of eyes. Um, Cause entrepreneurship can be quite lonely at times. You know, it was fantastic. But, you know, after we, we ran the figures and by the time you split the profit and the, 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 all this stuff, we decided as well, very much that we wanted to go in different directions and parted ways amicably. But you look at it now, it was probably the best thing we ever did because yeah, we've gone in completely different directions and both had far more success individually doing it separate. So it'd be quite good to speak yeah. on that really, I think. Yeah, because I think um, I think if, if we would have let that drag out for longer, that might have affected our relationship as well, like as friends, yeah. I think. Because I think, so. I think, yeah, I think we stopped it at the right time because I think it was common. Like we, I think we both felt that, okay, if we both want to stay, if we want to grow further, we're going to have to part ways. But I think we both just didn't want to admit to it back yeah. then because it was like, but you know, we're so used to this now. Like, why, why change it kind of thing? Yeah. And I think for me, because um, before that we met, like before we sort of part of ways, we met up in Liverpool. Um, I think just for that, I think I was there meeting family. And then you said, well, you know, I'll, I'll get the train. Uh, get the train up and we'll you know we'll we'll, we'll sit off somewhere I and mean, we were running the numbers i think we were doing like 20k a month uh back then but that was like total so first you've got your your course because we outsourced everything didn't we like literally yeah, yeah. like like everything from from the outreach the sales the no the sales calls we actually still did ourselves yeah we did outreach was outsourced and then the the, the facebook ads etc was all outsourced as well um so it ended up being like three or 4k each after everything was outsourced and all the costs were, were taken off and we were we were managing like quite a lot of clients you know to get up to 20k but the, the actual take home was 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 not a lot and um I, I think that was a moment for both of us when we ran those numbers and realized okay we're making 20k it's a multiple six-figure business but we're still actually on like a normal like yeah. regular wage yeah. i think that sort of both hit home for us like okay we need to switch something up or change something here you know, in order to actually, actually, you know, start growing. A hundred percent. Because I think, like, I think the average, the average marketing agency in the world operates at about a twenty-five percent profit margin. Now, you know, that's because, and that's more of a traditional agency. Granted, when you've yeah. got, you know, offices and stuff. But even if you take away all that stuff, I would say, on average, it does depend. I mean, I would, I would argue, the more you charge a client, the more your margins will go up. But on average, most agencies, online agencies, operate somewhere probably around the 50% margin, maybe 60%, something like that. Now, that's all great when when you're taking home that yourself. Like if, if that was just me running that 20K agency, it would be 10K profit. And you yeah. could argue if we had different skill sets, then it would be fine because we could probably double the growth of the business. So, for example, yeah. we're both very much the same. We're both um system builders we're both quite introverted we yeah. both i would say we're both good at sales but we both don't overly enjoy like, taking yeah, yeah. sales calls exactly. so this is where it become difficult because because we were almost the exact same person we both wanted to, to build the systems we both wanted to take direction of the company make decisions run it down the line because we're two of the same it didn't quite work as well 
I would argue maybe, and this is probably value for someone out there who's probably looking to start or considered having a business partner. If you want to, if you're going to do that, it would have been different if you were like king of sales and I was king of systems. That could work, you know. Yeah. I did all the. If I was a media buyer and you were sales, or you were sales and I was a media buyer, you could make that work because then you could argue right. It was 20k a month. I was doing all the media buying, taking on 10k, and you were doing all the sales, yeah. taking on 10k. Yeah. That could work, right? Um, but we both very much, I feel, had the the same role to a certain degree, um, and same similar strengths. And uh, because of that, it probably I would argue limited the growth of the company as well. So yeah. it, it was best for both of us in, in that. In yeah, that time. yeah, I think that, that's yeah. You hit the nail on the head there because when I look at um, back then, we both had limited experience with Facebook ads because to be fair, we always outsourced it. And yeah. I, I told you yesterday, didn't I? I, I would go through Facebook ad courses, and I just I, I'd force myself to watch it. Like I'd buy a course and then force myself to watch it, not taking any knowledge because I didn't like it. I'm just, I'm literally like watching on 2x speed just to go through as quickly as possible. Yeah. It's not interesting to me because I don't need to do it. And I'm like, yeah. then back then I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm the owner. I don't necessarily need to know all this stuff. I just need to find an outsourcer that can do its, its thing. Yeah. Uh, but because I had limited knowledge on Facebook ads, even when outsourcing, like they'll send me portfolios of like, Oh, I've gotten fifty thousand page likes for this client. I'm like, okay, that sounds good. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you didn't care about return on ad spend or anything like that. It was just say, yeah. I, I just you know, if, if you show me a random portfolio with growth, regardless of that's link clicks or click through yeah, rate or yeah. whatever, if there's an improvement and it looked like you, you knew your thing, then you know we'll give the job to you. And then obviously you know, we had we had Upwork was our main source of um, like prospecting and, and stuff. And then we outsourced that to a certain extent. Um, and then the sales calls was always like, are you going to take it? Nah, you know, I'll take it. You know, it's like yeah. one way. We both really didn't want to take the sales calls. Yeah. And then as soon as we got the client, it was like, okay, just outsource as quickly as possible. And then, you know, try and get on the next one. And you know what? When you look back at that now, it's so funny because it makes you realize how far I know I've come and you've come in yeah. a short period of time, you know, over the last few years. And it is funny because, you know, you look at, and it's very different for the both of us, but since we've parted ways, you know, you, you've gone down an angle of you, you have definitely higher profit margins than I do because you run the ads yourself. You've got less costs, um, but you've, you've got, you know, you've probably got less clients, but then you've got a, still a decent amount of clients, but you are the expert of the media buying. You've yeah. got a very different lifestyle, but you're having such good success with what you're doing over there. It absolutely is. You're crushing it. Right. But then also I could not have gone down a more different route. I have, we, I don't know what profit you're doing. I would probably guess we're probably doing somewhere similar in terms of profit figures um, after expenses. But the difference is, is I've got a lot more clients, but I've also yeah, got, got a lot overhead, lost. right? Yeah. You know, like as it stands right now, I think our overhead's about probably, you know, close to like three, 400 grand a year in overhead, which is a lot, right? Yeah. Um, that's just on the agency and that's from offices, management team. So, but again, I love the way that I do it. And, and you know, it's, it's so different, like how you manage and how I manage is so different. Um, but it works for both of us. And I, you know, yeah. I, I feel like there's some value here to take from people. I mean, let, I would it'd be probably quite a good exercise to, to say, if you say what you think your benefits and negatives are to the way you do it. And then I can yeah. say similar to mine, like, you know, what would you argue from your perspective? Like, if you want to give a bit more context on how you run it, but like, what would you say is the biggest benefit to the way that you run it? I think so. Just so everyone like sort of understands how I run it, um, the way. So if you look at like sort of the pillars of social media marketing, you got your outreach, your sales, your management, and then you know obviously you get results where you actually you know getting results with the clients. Yeah. For me, everything up to the actual results getting is automated to a certain degree or outsourced. So we've got Facebook ads for the outreach. We've got um, you know email marketing for the outreach. And then as soon as we get someone that's interested in our service, um, you know, we've got the sales. So, you know, basically where we get on calls with the clients, that's, um, you know, outsourced as well to my sales guy. And then it's only actually when a client decides that, you know, we are the agency that is going to take them to the next level. We agree that it's right fit for our agency because, you know, obviously we are very, uh, we've got a very specific niche. Then only then, but basically once, once the money comes in and I get the strike notification, that's when I found out we've actually got a client. And then from there, uh, you know, I do all of the, the media buying. So I get the results for the clients, et cetera. And for me, um, not necessarily comparing to what, what you're doing, but just for me in general, it's, it's a lot of peace of mind knowing that I'm the one that's getting the results. 
-hmm. Whereas previously, I would stress out about not getting results because I didn't really know what was going on. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, so we'd, we'd get a client and we'd outsource it. No idea if we're getting good results or not. Yeah. We'd hop on calls with the existing clients and I'd, have, I'd be panicking because I didn't really know what, what to say because I didn't know what was going on. Like they'd ask me, okay, how are we getting, you know, what's the next step? And I wouldn't know. I'd just be chatting shit basically and, until yeah, the calls yeah. ended and then just hope that the media buyer is, is doing its thing. And now, you know, we don't have a lot of calls with our existing clients just because of the way everything is, is streamlined. But when they do on up, up on a call and they ask me how it's going, I can tell them like right down to a T, you know, what the next steps are, what kind of results they can expect, how much money we're making them. Um, so the fact that I now know exactly, you know, where I can take a client is, uh, is bringing a lot of peace of mind. And the fact that, as you already mentioned, you know, it is still a very lean business because it's all virtual. So yeah. we've got no office space, um, you know, all the clients all, all in contact, you know, we're in contact with all the clients through Zoom. Yeah. Um, and let's say, hypothetically speaking, I were to lose a lot of clients, I haven't got any anyone on a full-time wage or anything like that that I need to stress out about because the less clients we have, um, you know, we can just like get rid of certain software costs if certain clients go away. Yeah. So like our costs diminish with the clientele, you know, if the clientele decreases. Yeah. So your um, margins ultimately will stay somewhat the same. Yeah. Increase yeah. If clients drop off, um, which is the opposite to me. Like, and this is where it's interesting because, um, you know, it's very different because I would say with that, that is for someone um, who's probably less risk averse. Like, yeah, like you have a lot more. Uh, I probably have more sleepless nights than you do. <laughs> because yeah, of of how much overhead yeah. I've got, right? Like if I was to lose half of my client base overnight, my company would be unprofitable. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. my agency anyway would be unprofitable. Like I've yeah. got other streams of income and stuff, but like my actual agency as a business itself would be un unprofitable with all the overhead that I have. And unlike you, I could get rid of software costs, sure, but I can't just fire someone because we lose a couple of clients, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it's definitely interesting, but I mean, what I'd like to say on the note of that, what is a, and this is where everybody's different, but as a, a negative, would you say is that you can't disconnect or can you? Like how you, how many hours a day do you work? And then what happens, like what happens if you fall sick or what happens if you, yeah. like hypothetically speaking, you were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, what happens there? Is there a backup plan? Have you got, you know, like what, what, what what's the deal there? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, so if I look at my daily structure, um, yeah, but just because obviously, you no, know, I'm, I'm at my computer 24 7 to be fair, yeah. just because I actually enjoy it. Like, yeah. I'm always looking up things, I'll research stuff, I'll, you know, I'll buy courses and stuff like that and go through those. But if I just look at what I actually have to do on a daily basis, I think I'll spend about 90 minutes to two hours a day running the ads. And that's, that's, that's only when this, yeah, that, yeah, so that's, that's it. It is every single day. So every single day, there is at least one thing that I need to do, which is check the ads. I don't make changes every day. Like sometimes I'll race through it in 50 minutes, realize all the clients are profitable, then I don't need to do anything. Yeah. But, you know, let's, most days there is at least one change I need to make to at least one account just because, you know, I am managing 25 clients. So yeah. there's always one client that needs some kind of changes made to the ads. Or, you know, they'll like obviously now Black Friday's coming up. So that's, and we're getting a lot of content for Black Friday. So every single day yeah. I'll check. There is there at least a new image or a new carousel that I need to settle because Black yeah. Friday's coming up. Um, so that is the one negative, like, whereas, because we, we, we talked about that yesterday, didn't we, where you said, you know, when I look at my day to day, I'm actually, because we were talking about when to do this collaboration, you said, well, to be fair, I'm, I'm quite flexible. There's not actually a lot, um, yeah. in my calendar nowadays, um, with me, it, there is always at least one thing, which is obviously, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the managing of the ads, 